Beam as a streaming platform has the humble beginnings of a hackathon in Berlin and an IHOP in Seattle. Such humble beginnings people are wondering right now if they clicked the right video. Beam then, and Mixer as most of us know it now, was a streaming platform quickly gobbled up by tech giant Microsoft with the intents and purposes of challenging none other than Amazon's Twitch, which has dominated the internet streaming world for almost a decade. Founded by two young and talented Minecraft server hosters, Matt Salsamendi and James Bohm, Mixer would be featured on Xbox's very own Xbox One Store, and then marketed towards PC audiences with exclusive seven-figure streaming contracts with the two most famous Twitch streamers of the time, Shroud and Ninja. Within four years, Mixer would lose both founders and be absorbed into Facebook gaming by 2020. What went wrong with the young upstart streaming platform that had latency speeds tenths of a second, which was much faster than Twitch? What ultimately led to the death of the platform as it got gobbled up by Facebook gaming? On this episode of Death of a Game, we denude the mystery behind the only major platform in the past five years to go head-to-head -head with current streaming behemoth, Twitch. Grab your sparks, embers, and skills for this ride down the biggest Twitch competitors yet, Ultimate Demise. The story of Mixer begins back in 2015 when Matt Salsamendi and James Bowman team flew to Berlin to participate in a hackathon. It's during this time they're able to achieve 0.5 second end-to-end -end video latency. What that exactly meant yet wasn't determined, but it was innovative technology that meant that they could create something with it. Matt, age 17 at the time, and co-founder James, age 19, and in the possession of a technology that could be used for, well, just about anything in the world of streaming and online entertainment. The duo had experience working together as practically kids as far back as 2011 under the company MC Hosting, which, yes, stood for Minecraft. One of the largest Minecraft hosting platforms, I might add. They had the history of working together, but what their next move intended to be would prove to be quite momentous. In an attempt to prototype a game controlled entirely by livestream viewers, think Twitch plays Pokemon but without such a heavy delay, Matt and team had managed to fly a drone with under 300 milliseconds of latency. This would mean the actual ability to play as a livestream viewer. It wasn't until sometime near the end of 2015 or the beginning of 2016 that Matt and James finally decided on what their company was going to focus on. In a fateful day at an IHOP, Matt and co basically decided they were going to do a streaming platform. They even went the next few hours brainstorming what that would look like, and as Matt Salsamendi would later say on Twitter, perhaps went a bit overboard. Young and talented entrepreneurs banding together in the tech sector with the promise of an algorithm that can solve a lot of problems. Like other tech startups, they would need to get noticed to build the kind of connections they needed in order to provide the funding to scale their platform. Early on for Beam, the intention was to scale. Like most technology startup companies, in order to do this, you would need money or the ability to scale up. This brings on investors who now own a majority of your company, or perhaps they bring in a board which now you only have a couple of seats for. Matt and James contacted a popular Minecraft streamer at the time, who was unhappy with Twitch and convinced him and many others to give Beam a try early on. These were the smaller, more personal creators, the kind who Beam had attracted from the start as a competitor to Twitch. After the humble beginnings of an IHOP, Beam Interactive would enter its public beta May 9th, 2016. It featured viewer-to-game controls and group autonomy controls. In the spring of 2016, Beam had managed to log 100,000 users on the site. The biggest win of Beam's short career came days later. They had won TechCrunch Disrupt New York 2016. The true goal of something like TechCrunch 2016 was meeting the right people to form the right relationships. Beam at TechCrunch is a spitting image of the TechCrunch episode in the popular comedy show Silicon Valley. It took three days of coding to get the tech demo on the floor to actually work, and when the demo did work, it actually was able to stream at 4K 60 frames, I might add. Beam might have wowed the judges, but the most important person they had wowed had been none other than the head of the Xbox division himself, Phil Spencer of Microsoft. 18-year-old Matt and 20-year-old James had just gotten the opportunity of a lifetime. It took a few months to reach a deal, but Beam had already begun scaling up before a deal was even reached, I was told by an anonymous source from Mixer. Microsoft would officially acquire Beam Interactive August 11, 2016, which would immediately include a large influx of cash, massive staff hirings, game integrations, and most important of all, the access to an already massive and pre-existing Xbox audience. 
I was told that profit wasn't expected for three to four years, which gives us a timeline of how much the newly acquired Microsoft streaming platform, Beam, would have until they, well, had to show results. The cogs were in motion now after that check was signed, and there was only one way now, Ford. Xbox insiders on the Xbox One would get access to the Beam app on their platform starting February 2017. This was a necessary step towards public access to the streaming platform. Details concerning how Beam would function, which was due to be out in the spring, would be the utilization of sparks or experience points that viewers would acquire from viewing and then they could use these to unlock XP boosters, emotes, and more. Unfortunately, these wouldn't come until the next year. By March 2017, the Beam app would be available to all Xbox One users. Just like that, Beam went from being over 100,000 organic users to potentially millions of Xbox users. The Xbox didn't previously have its own streaming platform, and now that they had one built into their console, Microsoft wasn't going to stop there. After changing their name to Mixer, which is pretty typical when you get acquired by a big corporation, Mixer No Longer Beam was intent on using E3 as their opportunity to garner excitement. Microsoft would use a giveaway strategy offering free games and a DLC for Minecraft, Halo Wars 2, and Hawken to those who turned into the main conference. The employee I spoke to from Mixer told me that Matt and James and other core members of the team did indeed want to keep the Beam name, but unfortunately Microsoft already had everything in ink, so there was no chance. My source also notified me that at the time of E3 2017, the team had to basically create an entirely new Mixer environment, because the one they were attempting to showcase had crashed, like legitimately crashed, like the actual instance itself. The issues had been because, as I was told, six months of complete lack of bug fixing up until this point. Momentum wasn't giving Mixer the proper time to focus on bug fixing. Microsoft was proud to show off new features in its new streaming platform. Meanwhile, Mixer was met with this immense growth in corporate overhead, which was probably complicating things. Although Mixer was ahead of Twitch in some aspects, such as latency, multi-stream capability, and viewer interactivity, it was lacking the equivalent of free bits, which were the Twitch-based currency that streamers could cash out on. Sparks would finally come in November of 2018 during what was called Season 2 for Mixer. What would also accompany the addition was skills, which were basically emotes. The difference between these and emotes in, say, Twitch was that skills in Mixer allowed you to, once past a certain threshold, start making money. The more engaged your audience was, the more money you could make. That was a very interesting concept. Embers were planned eventually for 2019, which were more of the paid virtual currency type, paid bits from Twitch essentially. Sparks were still more interesting in my eyes because unlike Embers, they didn't require viewers to purchase them, and yet eventually they could monetarily support their favorite streamer. While Mixer had some new and unique features, they had taken some time to add features that by the end of 2018 standards had seemed like expected features of a streaming platform. But perhaps Mixer's unique twist on things could prove to be the different kind of approach that would attract the right audience. By the end of 2018, things started to change for Mixer. It's at this point that, under the Microsoft banner, they had been there for almost three years, which meant in just one year they were expected to reach a return on the investment that they had borrowed. In May 31st, 2019, Mixer slash Microsoft approached one of the top Twitch streamers, Dr. Disrespect, unsuccessfully. But this wouldn't be the first time and only competitive play that Mixer would make in 2019 regarding top streamers. A bombshell would hit the web August 1st, 2019 that Ninja, or Tyler Blevins as he was known by, was the biggest name in Fortnite and one of the top Twitch streamers, and he would be leaving Twitch to stream exclusively on Mixer. This deal would be reported to be worth between 20 and 30 million per year, something completely unheard of in the internet realm at the time. The move here was obvious. Go after the top Twitch streamers with never before seen exclusive top dollar contracts and hope that with their popularity, you can inject a new audience into your new streaming platform. Or it could be seen as a move of desperation, because remember, they were edging ever closer to facing the gallows if that return on their investment or that ROI wasn't high enough. Within a few days, Ninja had broken a million subscribers on Mixer. Well, kinda. It turns out that Microsoft had purchased over 1.5 million subs for free as a promotional event to bring people over during Ninja's launch on Mixer. That's kind of like record labels buying their own artists' copy in order to just kind of inflate their numbers, but it doesn't really do much to build a real audience or track what the real audience actually is. It's more so an audience that very likely isn't going to stay when it's no longer free for them to subscribe to their favorite streamer, like say for example Ninja. Mixer was originally the mom and pop specialty shop of the online streaming platform. At least that's the kind of vibe I got from it. Its attempts to go mainstream were proving to be costly. 
millions of dollars of costly. And would these decisions ultimately pay off? For Ninja, on the other hand, or other top perspective creators, they didn't need to worry about numbers anymore, how many people were watching. With guaranteed pay, it was, as Ninja himself would later state, less stressful in that respect. A dagger of news hit the web October 2nd, 2019, when it came out that Mixer co-founder James Bohm would be leaving the company. James said he was out to develop the industry and its communities. What that exactly means, we have no idea. What I do know is that, well, Matt and James had deals. Like most who go into business as founders with companies like Microsoft, their deals stipulate a minimum amount of time spent. In regards to leaving the company, it could be a combination of realizing your influence is shrinking, maybe it's not the same company anymore, or you're just trying to cash out as soon as you can get out. Simply put, Mixer wasn't the same company anymore. It had grown far too large. While Mixer at first started as the specialty store I mentioned beforehand, who targeted the smaller creators who were unhappy and disenfranchised with Twitch, by 2019 the strategy had shifted, and as my source tells me the majority of the small creators who had originally come over from Twitch to join Beam had gone back to Twitch. It didn't matter how much money or theatrics you threw at Mixer at this point. At some point results were going to come out, and if they weren't good enough, Microsoft isn't above pulling the plug. According to Business Insider, Ninja brought more streamers than viewers, and that isn't a good problem to have in entertainment. Now, it's unsure what exactly happens past this point, but some big meeting happened, supposedly, and Matt and James seemed to be in a disagreement about how things were handled with maybe their bosses, the executives, or the suits. Eight days later, after his co-founder and friend, James, leaves Mixer, co-founder Matt Salsamendi would also leave the company to go work on lasers. You can't completely read into founders leaving a company they started after an acquisition just simply because for many of them, as I mentioned before, this is a particularly lucrative deal. With both founders gone from Mixer, however, and the fact that their leaving was in such close proximity of each other, it either is an incredibly crazy coincidence, or it doesn't bode well for Mixer going forward. It's very possible the large decision that would follow Matt's departure had at least something to do with it. Doubling down on their trickle-down strategy, Mixer or Microsoft at this point, who knows, would be adding another Twitch megastar to the exclusive streaming roster, Shroud. His deal a reported over eight figures, which is 10 million or so plus. This was their chosen attempt at bringing an audience to Mixer now. Ninja was on record saying that he preferred Mixer despite the lower viewers in December of 2019. Which is kind of a no-brainer, right? But it's not the kind of mentality you want your top paid streamer to have when it comes to growing the company. But that's not necessarily Ninja's job. His job was to bring eyeballs, as was Shroud's, which they succeeded at in spades. The problem was, is while well, those eyeballs are wondering, and would quickly return to Twitch when they got bored of the novelty of Mixer. It wasn't that Mixer was an outright inferior platform technically, it was more about perception with viewers. When the top streamers like Shroud and Ninja are only getting a fraction of the numbers they were getting before, it doesn't inspire much. Not to mention many other content creators are rising to stardom on Twitch, especially in the world of Fortnite, to fulfill the vacuum that Ninja had left. The attempts to aggressively seek an audience through ways of getting exclusive contracts on top creators wasn't proving to be entirely fruitful for Mixer yet. These are the dangers of artificially creating a market. It doesn't matter how much money you put behind a bad recipe, and what I mean by bad recipe is simply this. Mixer might have had this amazing FTL proprietary technology, and had a fun and different approach to streaming, but it wasn't particularly effective at making money. Without API interactions and Xbox partnerships, Mixer as a streaming platform itself didn't have a good strategy or plan for making money as my prior employee Contech explains. That cooped with the aforementioned artificial audience, or think artificial ingredients, then you have, as I mentioned before, a bad recipe. The problem was, it was too late to organically and slowly grow the audience for Mixer at this point. It already had too high expectations, and it was already too expensive. And it was already in the ring with a behemoth in the online world, and it was losing pretty bad. Streamlabs and Newzoo teamed up for some meta-analysis concerning YouTube gaming, Twitch, and Mixer's growth as streaming platforms. The data states that Mixer more than doubled its numbers of hours watched and streamed from the previous year, and had nearly the same amount of streamers as Twitch did. Concurrent viewer averages, on the other hand, weren't even close at 37,000.5 averaging to Twitch's 1.06 million. More data would come out in May of 2020, and this was even more condemning for Mixer. 
Twitch had its expected monster year of a near 100% growth year on year. YouTube gaming at 65%, Facebook gaming at an impressive 238%, and then there's Mixer. Mixer had a 0.2% year-on-year growth, and especially concerning their hours watched already being lower than the others, this is pretty damning news for the platform. Considering the poor results in May, it wasn't a surprise just one month later that Microsoft would announce that they would be shutting down Mixer to partner with Facebook Gaming. The success of partners and streamers on Mixer is dependent on our ability to scale the platform for them as quickly and broadly as possible. It became clear that the time needed to grow our own live streaming community to scale was out of measure with the vision and experiences that Microsoft and Xbox want to deliver for gamers now. So we've decided to close the operations side of Mixer and help the community transition to a new platform. Facebook gaming still wins because they likely don't have to pay as much for Mixer, because Microsoft is both looking to offload or axe Mixer in general, as well as they still, well, need a streaming platform to work with. Microsoft wins because they get to keep the very important technology behind Mixer's FTL, which they can leverage for a plethora of things, especially in the age of online media. Mixer, on the other hand, the greatest loser, scheduled to be shut down with links redirected to the Facebook gaming platform. Matt Salsamendi following the news stated that something in retrospect I wish I spent more time chatting with the individual contributors on our support, enforcement, partner management, original content teams. Passionate people with ears very close to our community. Lots to learn and some of the most important roles at Mixer. This sort of logic falls in line with what we have been stating in regards to the trickle up versus trickle down ecosystem. Mixer might have started as a creator first platform, but after it became about these expensive exclusive contracts that sort of evaporated with it. These big streamers don't do a whole lot to help the other streamers, all of the other streamers. I should add I think that it's very easy to want to demonize Microsoft in this entire story. They were, after all, the ones who swung the sword. But the same ex-employee I spoke to told me that Microsoft went well and above and beyond their power to help Mixer. Whether through the immense funding that they couldn't have ever dreamed of otherwise, or the access to their massive Xbox audience. Microsoft waited that four-year period and wasn't satisfied with the results so far. Microsoft also very likely realized that the investment in order to compete against Twitch was going to need to be enormous, and it wasn't something that they were just intent on continuing. With Mixer links all redirecting to Facebook gaming, Mixer's bright but short time in the sun has come and gone. The important thing to take away is identifying the key reasons for Mixer's failures as a streaming platform. This way we can understand the mystery surrounding the death of a game, Mixer, in a hope not to repeat the past. Don your fedoras, whether literal or figuratively, as we take a look at all the gathered clues and evidence concerning the story of Mixer. And, uh, oh yeah, hit the music. Not that I necessarily like to use age as an excuse, but Mixer founders were both young and inexperienced yet in charge of a new multi-million dollar streaming platform with Microsoft level funding. Yeah, problems. Mixer scaled up immensely, so much so that they had long-term logistical and technical issues caused by such. This resulted in things like no bug fixing or quality control focus. Success didn't match their corporate bloat, and the year-on-year -year data shows that they lacked viewers versus streamers. Remember, at one point, more partner managers than partners. Mixer just didn't have a good recipe for money, and that's important in business. Going after an audience that wasn't organic created this artificial or even temporary market. Ninja and Shroud signings were 30 plus million dollar mistakes. Well, for Mixer. Mixer was missing key features needed to compete against the top platform in Twitch. Whether it be their lack of fewer bot moderation options, no affiliate mode, they didn't have mass gifting subs, pre-rolls didn't come until late 2019, and ad breaks, mid-ad breaks didn't come until 2020, they were lacking the features. The story of Mixer is one that will be remembered for some time I believe. It's another cautionary tech startup tale gone awry. Another proprietary tech doesn't make a business scenario. But it's not just one of those stories. It's the story of a company from humble beginnings in Seattle under the name Beam and their mission to focus on satisfying the viewers and their needs. Mixer was successful in not just creating a faster latency for streamers and viewers alike, but also a more interactable relationship between the two. 
In the process of obtaining that goal, the scale of things morphed past the point of no return. But Mixer's death wasn't just another story. It was the story of possibly the best Twitch competitor failing yet to slay the beast. Thanks for watching, guys. All right, people, let's search this dump and get out of here ASAP.